so I'll introduce Mike Harrison, who will continue on the processing theme. Yes, okay. thank you. Okay. Uh, so Mike Harrison from CETEC Innovation. I'll take Craig's lead and just briefly introduce you to CETEC Innovation. Uh, we're a much smaller organisation in Camden. We're a, a specialist uh, process development company just up the road uh, near Ellesmere Port uh, in, in this Chester area. And as we work in a whole range of innovation, helping people find grants, put um, new innovative systems together, help people in, in innovative um, thought processes. But our major work is in developing new processes and new technologies, and the food industry is, is one of our major areas of development. Um, and as Craig uh, carefully, uh, kindly said, he's kind of spared a little area of his talk on thermal processing, uh, which is the one that I'm going to pick up on because there's quite some similarities between the sorts of processes that Craig and I will be talking about. Um, so I'm going to focus on three technologies. Um, the title is Novel Food Processing. Um, I'm talking about a few technologies that have actually been around for quite a while, so perhaps not that novel, but as we heard yesterday, innovation is not just about something brand new, it's new ways of using things. So I think I'd just like to talk about some ways that some of these technologies can be used in a slightly different, more novel way uh, to, to look at innovative trip, uh, use of those sorts of things. So the three I've chosen to, to talk about, radio frequency heating, overheating, vacuum cooling, some thermal technologies, as Craig said. So I'll just uh, start off by talking about radio frequency. I don't know how familiar people will be in radio frequency. It's very similar to microwave processing, um, but the frequency is different. Instead of uh, thousands of megahertz, it's tens of megahertz. So that's a hundred times difference in frequency, and that equates uh, equate to a hundred times difference in wavelength. Um, so as in microwaves, you'll, you'll be aware that you get heating and hot and cold spots forming in your microwave some centimeters apart. Because the wavelength in our record is much longer, those hot and cold spots fall much further apart, and also because of the longer wavelength, the, the wave can penetrate more deeply into a food. So you can actually get much more uniform heating throughout your food and penetrating more deeply into it. So in many ways, radio frequency for, for, for a lot of foods can act in the way that I think a lot of us think microwaves should work, and we would hope microwaves to work to give that full body heating uh, and uniform heating. Radio frequency is applied slightly differently to, to microwaves. Instead of having a microwave generator and pushing <coughs> microwaves into a cavity, um, radio frequency is formed by a generator and, and, and the power can be taken by quite a long uh, coaxial cable to, to the cavity here where it's applied. And generally, a radio frequency would be applied between two electrodes, two applicator planes. And you can see how this kind of simulates many ways a capacitor. So it's like a lossy capacitor and there's heat being generated between those plates. So you can see that the, in this here, the, the, the radio frequency field will be generated in this area here. It makes it quite controllable where you actually put the radio frequency energy in. You can also see, schematically, but still, um, that the ports here can be quite wide, assuming something like <coughs> low flight going in. And quite a large port. With microwave energy, you have to be careful how the microwave uh, might leak from the cavity. You have to be the same with RF. But because of that much bigger wavelength, you can use quite large ports. So it makes ingress and, and, and egress of food through the RF cavity somewhat easier to, to engineer. Another just quick toy is the, is the, um, the, the technology uh, of 50 ohm RF, which is a, a newer version of, of RF, which has been around for a long time, uh, allows the generator <coughs> to match, to tune to the applicator. And when, when that's tuned, that's when the energy is transferred over. Um, that's done by a matching network, a matching system, which is some variable capacitors and inductors that can move to make sure that when the product changes a little bit, the whole electrical circuit is kept stable. You can feed that information back to a computer and use that as control information. And so there's, a, there's quite a bit of information that can be brought back in an RF system to give you a quite an advanced control system that can be linked to the RF generator to vary power levels or change power levels as the product quality changes. But that's fairly standard uh, sort of technology, and radio frequency is, is quite widely used in, in post-baking, baking, you can see some pies <coughs> out of a, an, an RF oven there. That's an RF oven where you've got parallel plates, but it also has hot air in there as well. So a combination of radio frequency with hot air or infrared is a common way of employing, employing it. And you can see you know, the, the, um, 
I was going to say cakes, but they're pies or some sort of coming out there, in metal tins. We can develop those in metal tins, and the actual conveyor belt is metal as well. So you don't have to be scared of metal in the design of these. You can use uh, good quality uh, engineering there. So that's a, a common use of RF. Another, perhaps the most common in industry, is defrosting. You see quite a large defroster here. This is a few metres across, several metres long. Very common for defrosting of, of meats, uh, thawing, of thawing and defrosting. Um, thawing, bringing it up from minus 20 or so up to close to zero is, is very uh, common. When you start getting close to zero, both microwave and RF suffer a little bit with that phase change as the ice changes to water. It becomes a little bit more tricky, but that deep penetration of the RF can make sure that the, the product that you're heating heats quite uniformly so that you actually get quite a good performance on defrosting. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit, a, a bit later. Um, another major use of RF is drying. Uh, Post-baking and drying. Radio frequency is very good for levelling out moisture. If you have a range of products entering an RF dryer and one's wetter than the other, the RF, the RF energy will tend to be drawn to the wet spot and that will evaporate a bit quicker. And that's a uh, radio frequency is quite well used for uh, moisture levelling. I've also put in uh, just a picture of another uh, RF drying application. This is the drying of fruits. You can see here that these uh, apples were dried in, this is the graph goes so five or six hours, whereas normally they were taking it a day. And so it, it can give quite rapid four, five times in increases in drying rate from the application of quite low levels of RF to enhance your drying rate, which can give you much improved quality as well as uh, productivity. I said I'm going to talk a bit more about defrosting. Uh, say defrosting is, is very common for, um, for RF. Um, and uh, you get a good high quality product, drip loss is reduced. That uniformity of the heating you can get through that big bulk allows the whole temperature to rise uniformly and you don't get hot spots and cold spots. You don't get some bits defrosting earlier and, and, uh, and going over as, as badly as you do it in microwave systems. The point I wanted to, to, to discuss with you here, um, those are quite well used in industry, have been for several years, many years, but these are big pieces of equipment. RF defrosting is not used in commercial scale or domestic scale. We've got microwaves at home and, and, and in, the kitchen, in commercial kitchen, but radio frequency is not used. The RF generators haven't been available at a, at a small enough size, at a low enough cost. But we have recently developed low cost RF power supplies and we're currently developing a RF defroster which can be used in caging applications and certain things. So this is a, a kilowatt, a few hundred watts RF system which would be capable of being used in, in, in commercial scale systems. And it can do things like defrost chicken in some tens of minutes rather than many hours. So this will help with product inventory. You won't need to defrost a lot of stuff for your customers up front and keep, the thing, keep your fingers crossed that you use it all in the day, be able to respond throughout the day to, 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 uh, to needs. Um, we've looked at chicken, we've looked at uh, bakery products, there's quite a range of uh, things where you know, frozen product can be brought out uh, and that will obviously reduce waste and help in uh, productivity in those sorts of areas. So it's a move from industrial scale RF to more commercial scale is something that is coming and something I think to keep an eye on in the future. Another use of RF uh, that's, uh, that's, that's not as common is, is uh, in the inline. Craig re referenced some inline heating previously and mentioned RF. And yes, RF inline heating is something that's out there but not very commonly used. Here we're looking at a system where a meat slurry has been pumped into an RF system and cured by the application of just the RF heating. So again, that's quite a sizable chunk of, uh, of meat there. That can be heated very uniformly in RF. The, there's no hot surfaces involved, the heat goes into the product itself, so you've not got any temperature gradients across it, so the surface isn't going to be over-processed compared to the inside, you have good uniformity. You can heat quite rapidly, you can get good power densities from RF, so the power goes in quite quickly, so you get quite a compact system. And, uh, and, and it gives, and you can see in this picture, you can just tailor the output and actually come out of shaped products. So we're currently looking more at promoting the use of radio frequency in this inline heating to give a rapid, high quality production of cured products of that sort. That's another use of RF that's not that common and it's something that perhaps should be looked at more in the future. Another inline heating technology I just wanted to touch on, the second one on my list was ohmic heating. 
um, overheating is where you pass electricity through a product directly. RF is generated by a generator and passed through the air and, and, and transfers into the product. Radio frequency, your vapor. In its simplest form, you're just plugging two electrodes into a product and passing electricity through it. Looks comical, that actually works. You can actually just plug a sausage in like that. So I have a video if anyone wants to see it, but it's a little bit off-putting sometimes just before dinner, so I didn't think I'd uh, put everyone through that. But it's a very simple technology and concept. There's a lot of engineering required to make it work. But again, it has the same advantages of that rapid heating, small footprint, and the fact that there's no hot surface in there, so that you're actually heating something very quickly uh, but without actually any hot surfaces where you can get thermal degradation. So it's very good for uh, pasteurization, and that's what overheating is used for most commonly, is pasteurizing products very quickly. Um, particularly um, high slurries, so we have products where you've got particulates in. If I click over onto the next page to the picture, these sorts of products here with mixed particulates, the actual various particles will all be heated by the electric, electricity facing heat going through them. So you'll get a, a rapid heating of the uh, of the whole volume and the only heating that can handle quite sizable particulates going through it. There's an example here of, of some raspberries. This is a, a raspberry unprocessed. This one's been passed <coughs> uh, for uh, some uh, tens of seconds um, in an RF field and you can see very little visible structure. It was slightly softer. It had been pasteurized, but the, the structure is very good. You can retain very good structure with only heating. Um, so it's very good for, for temperature sensitive fluids where you don't want that hot surface to cause a degradation and get some uh, colour color change on the surface. It's good for particulates because the whole liquid can go through. There is going to be a slight difference in the temperature of the particulate to the liquid most of the time, um, but compared to a thermal conduction process, it's a much more uniform heating. Um, another use uh, is, is when you need controllability. Overheating is very controllable. You can switch the power on very quickly. So we've done lots of overheating systems where very accurate temperature control is required. And also, in some applications where you want very high temperatures, if you're getting up to many tens of degrees, hundreds of degrees, steam, which is the most common uh, heat transfer fluid, is problematic at those sorts of pressure temperatures because it's very high pressure steam. It's difficult to, to handle on the site. So uh, above 150 ohm is, is very uh, useful for that. Well, ohmic heating's been around for 20 years as well. So what's, what's new in ohmic heating? Well, some of the new areas, there's been quite a lot of work just recently on um, what people are actually referring to medium fields processing. So this is basically ohmic heating. But people are identifying what are the factors relating to heat, which is the, usually what people treat ohmic heating as a, as a heating system. It's looked upon as a thermal processing system. But research recently is showing that there are some reported field effects so that at a given temperature, you're getting a greater uh, kill than you'd expect, and that's been put down to electric field effects causing damage to the cell membranes and things. That work's still progressing. There's, there's work coming in um, from various places, a lot of people working on it. I think it still needs to coalesce a bit, but there is certainly more work being done on those field effects, so whether pasteurization and sterilization can be done perhaps at slightly lower temperatures, but still getting the same as north figures. Um, Another area that uh, we've been looking at recently, overheating, as I said, used mainly for pasteurization. So you take a product and just before it goes into packaging, an aseptic processing, heat it up to temperature, cool it, and package it. That's the most common uses of overheating. But we've been looking at, at how overheating can be used for cooking. You can see in some of these graphs here, this is a the purple is a conventional cook, and the, uh, the, the blue is a bit more of an omic cook. You can see that the same sorts of products, when we've tried to cook things in omic, with omic heating, we can get half to third, sometimes a quarter uh, of the processing time to get to the textural um, level that you want. Um, it's still a longer process than omic heating would normally be. Normally, pasteurization would be tens of seconds, <coughs> 30 seconds, perhaps a minute. To cook, we're talk probably talking some minutes, two minutes, four minutes, five minutes. So there's some difference in, in ohmic heat design required there, perhaps longer continuous systems, or perhaps batch systems where are things we're looking at. But the actual cooking of, of, of ohmic is something that I don't think is done very much, and it's something we're looking at. Um, we've actually been doing some work with some of the guys here with Graham at Chester, 
and we've identified perhaps some, some signs, initial signs of, of vitamin retention and better bioavailability of some of the enzymes, and that's some work that, that they'll be doing a bit more in Chester over the coming year, I think, or a year or two, to try and tie that down a bit more. But that's some interesting signs on quality advantages that you could get when cooking with OVP. And one little final thing, I talked about how that RF defrosting is transferring from industrial to domestic. There's not much signs of omic transferring from industrial to domestic at the moment, but there is some uh, work. Uh, there's a new uh, patent, recently a, a control technology that's been uh, that's patented, which allows omic heating to be developed for low cost applications. The first thing we've done with it is, is try to put it into a, a kettle. So this is just a, a water heating normal kettle, and that actually heats water without the, the noise that you get from your normal kettle. Um, but that's a water heating application. But that same sort of technology could be used for more um, food processing. So we're about to start looking at, at how we can start uh, applying that sort of same sort of control technology to perhaps small domestic or commercial cooking vessels that give you a rapid cook with all the advantages of, of over heating, perhaps these cooking speed rate peaks. Um, and that advantage of no hot surfaces, it's not going to burn on to the overcook, and that's something that we're starting to look at. So that might be a future development of a, a novel use of overcooking heating into that area. I have one other little uh, technology just to, to talk about as well, just to try and keep things moving into a slightly different area. Um, vacuum cooling, vacuum cooling, another system that's pretty well known. You know, people use vacuum cooling for cooling of sources as well as. Um, uh, of cooling of produce after harvest to, to, to extend its, uh, its life. Um, but one area uh, that's perhaps a little bit less known in, in vacuum processing that's uh, doing some work, uh, we're actually actually doing some work uh, with Camden uh, on this at the moment, is, is the use of the vacuum system after, uh, after a bake or as part of a baking process. So what we're looking at is baking uh, a loaf or a cake and then taking it out of the baking process slightly earlier and putting it into a vacuum system, pulling a vacuum on it, which will cool it, but the latent heat that's retained in the loaf or the cake allows the cooking process to continue during the initial part of that cooling process. So what we actually do is take out a, a cake or a, a loaf out of the cooking process earlier than you normally would, and this could be like 20% of an eight, so you can reduce it to about 80% of the cook time, say, still looking at the figures for different products, but the, the baking can be reduced to only about 80% of its time, and obviously there's a, a, an associated energy saving there and process productivity uh, and enhancement, and then moved into the, the vacuum cooler to actually finish off the, the bake. And you can see this is a, a, a graph from a, a normal um, baking time, and you can see that this has been reduced to 23 with no real change. You can see if we reduce the, the bake time too, too much, we get this peak, which is a sign that the, the bake has not progressed effectively. But you can see that just around about the 20 minutes, you can bring it down. So somewhere from 26 down to 20, 21 minutes is a, is a reduction in the cooking time, the, the baking time that, 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 that's possible there. And that will lead to energy savings, as I said, but also the fact that that cooling is done in that contained environment will also reduce uh, surface contamination from uh, avoidance of an ambient cooling technique that you might normally use. So that's just another you know, vacuum cooling, fairly well known technology, but another slight change to the way that might be used that can give other advantages that people might not be aware of. So just in summary, I said I've talked about a few technologies, it was novel processing, I've talked about some processes there that are pretty well known. Many people say there's nothing new under the sun, but it's that innovation step is perhaps thinking about different ways that they can be used uh, to give advantage. So, hopefully, there's time for a few questions as well. So, um, <laughs> if there's anything there I, I've uh, rushed over that anyone would like some more information, please let me know. My favourite sort of questions, please. Questions for Mike? Can I ask something? You talked about what you said were. All technologies. Are these all company in place? So you're actually able to tweak them and move them in a way so you're talking about here. Yeah. Again, value from what's already been used. Yeah. Um, radio frequency has been used since the 70s, uh, just following on from micro development. That's quite common in those uh, post baking, drying, very common in the food industry as well as other industries, textile industries. Um, 
the, the change to, uh, to a, a smaller size is more to do with developing a generator system that was low cost enough, and that's done. The actual way the RF heating will apply in the defrosting process, that's well known and, and is well seen in industry. Um, Omic heating, that was developed in, in the 80s and has been on sale through the 90s, so 20 or so years. Has been sold for quite a long time, there's applications around the world. Never kind of picked up as much as uh, uh, I think was expected, and uh, it, it has some specific niches where it's used, but that's why I think it's worth looking, exploring wider applications of how omic heating might be used in areas where people, people might just think, oh, that's a pasteurization technology. And if you start thinking more broadly about it as a heating technique that can be used in different ways, it might increase its applicability. But that equipment's out there, it's well established, and there's nothing really that, as I say, if we're doing cooking, the time will be longer. So we'll have to look at some slight changes to the design and batch over heat systems that I suggested. They're not common. It's nearly always a continuous system. The technology but the principles there and in, in industry, all of those technologies are used in, in, to, to, to quite a significant extent. But I still think there's much more room for, for, for use of those technologies in those applications, but also in some new applications that perhaps we can turn our minds to. Just, just to add a comment to that, I think when Omic Heating first came on the scene in the 80s, it got a bit of bad press because the, the control systems were quite, quite complex. Yes. And it, was, it worked brilliantly when it had a trained operative, and then it went horribly well wrong when it had a factory. And I think people were a bit more off from that. Well, well, that's changed now. It, I, I think it has, and quite recently we have been uprating some control schemes for, for companies who've got Omic Heaters. We've been looking at modernising them to some extent to improve those to help with that. And these days, a system of touch screens, all automated, lots of feedback, and allows them to, to run. And there's some interesting data that we can feed back to improve the control, to make them more self-monitoring, to, to help on that as well. So, yeah, thank you very much. I think that's a good point. Thanks very much indeed. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs>